Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. What is your life worth, people? What is your life worth? Do you is it a way to monetize what your life is worth? Do you get is it all about when you get to the end of your life and people say how much property that individual owned, how much uh, land that individual owned, or is it about what uh, advice, what friends you made? What is it about? How do you value? How do you determine what your life is worth? How do you determine what a person's life is worth? I think you determine what a person's life is worth when at the end of their life, when they're gone, what people thought about them, uh, what people, you know what I'm saying, would share about that individual and what people would do for the people that that individual left behind. I think that's, for me, that's the way that you can determine what a person's life is worth. Because a lot of times you run into people, you meet people in your life that They don't have any money. They don't have any property, but they'll give you some knowledge that you will be able to use and take you further in your life as a person, make you feel good, make you get in touch, help you get in touch with your humanity. A person like that, somebody that will bring you to a point to where you are become the person that you were intended to be by the most high. A person, a person like that, their life is priceless, priceless. I think all life is priceless. But the way we conduct ourselves throughout the, throughout our short period on this earth is going to determine what others think your life is worth. And that's what I'm going to share in this story. In this story, that's what I'm going to share. And if you want to really understand what I'm talking about in this story, you're going to have to pay attention to all the ins and outs, the ups and downs, the trials and tribulations that this individual went through before you'll be able to come to that point where you say, I get it. So I don't want you to turn off, you know what I'm saying, when you listen to this show. And if you do turn off, turn it back on and and, and figure out, you know what I'm saying, pick back up where you left off and, and just try to understand what it's like, you know, especially when you're a gang member, especially when the people that you surround yourself with, that those gang members surround themselves with, how they treat them uh, by way of what they say about them after they're gone. This life is a cold, harsh one, y'all. And it's one that I would hope that most of you, all of you, would reject because it's not the type of life that you want. I'm telling you, it's not the type of life that you want. But let me jump right into the story, you know. In this story... I'm talking about two young men, okay? Both of these young men were friends. They grew up to be friends, but before they were friends, they were enemies. One grew up on one side of the town. The other grew up on the other side of the town, right? But what brought them together was their competition, their their love for basketball. They played against each other in a, a lot of the city games, and this is when they were around 14, 15 years old, and they were good. They were really, really good. They did not back down from each other, and they would take it to each other, you know. And the games were about split, who won more, on all this and that. But like a lot of teenagers, they took the competition on the court, off the court. And at times when they would meet at the rec center on either person's side of town, they would get into fights. But those fights drew boundaries. See, back then, it wasn't about pulling out the gun or the knife to try to hurt each other. It was about drawing boundaries. You know, a lot of times, and I'm not condoning fighting and anything like that, but when you're dealing with men especially, a lot of men, uh, when we're kids, that's how we develop those boundaries, those hierarchies, you know what I'm saying, in our relationships. And these two young men, both of them were, uh, destined to be alpha males, as we call them, you know? So they fought on the court and off the court, but they became very, very good friends. But they did like a lot of teenagers do. They started to pay attention to those people in the streets that gravitated towards them because they were natural born leaders, because they liked their, their, their competitive spirit on and off the court. But When they drew towards them, they brought that lifestyle of of lawlessness with them. 
And because they were young and impressionable, it rubbed off. Instead of them taking that mantle as leaders, they became followers. And they started to participate in those activities off the court that led them to be incarcerated. That story is familiar in a lot of neighborhoods, in a lot of communities, in a lot of people's lives. And when they ended up in juvenile, they ultimately ended up in adult prison. But the thing about this story is that when they ended up in adult prison, they still had that alpha male charisma going on, both of them. And gangs on the inside of the institution gravitated toward them, and they would be propositioned all the time. You know, they wanted them to play on their basketball teams. They wanted them to hang out with them and work out. They wanted them to do things with them. And one of the individuals that I'm talking about, he became enamored with this, the, the attention that he was getting and, and all of these things. And, and I can't tell you what made one join the game and the other one not join the game. But the one that didn't join the game, he would tell his friend, look, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't join the game, man. We don't need this. We stand on our own. You feel what I'm saying? We're going to go through this thing together. But like, you know, most people in prison, you get separated. Some people, sometimes you get shipped to one institution and you, and the other one gets sent to another. So when that happened, his friend Charlie, Charlie joined the game. He joined the game. And it's not necessary for me to tell you what gang it was because all gangs have the same uh, type of understanding mentality when it comes to the love that they share. It's real until it's not. You understand what I'm saying? It's real until it's not. And a lot of brothers do mean it, but the way the gangs are structured, if somebody makes a decision, I'm, just, I'm, I'm not going to get into that yet. I'm going to stay off of that part. But the point I made, let me get back to the story. Let me get back to the story because I was almost getting distracted and I was getting ahead of myself. But here's the thing. Charlie gets transferred to another institution while Randy, he stays at the institution that both of them came in originally. But Charlie, he joins the game and he moves up very, very fast. He, he can fight. He's well-liked. And so it gave people, uh, uh, they felt comfortable, you know, when he talked, even though he was much, much younger than most of them. He had this ability to, to listen and look at a situation and say, no, this is right or this is wrong. And that was amazing to a lot of the people that had lived that lifestyle, that had come up in that lifestyle, that he was able to do this because he wasn't raised that way. His experiences were not like that. But theirs was. You know what I'm saying? So at the end of the day, he moved up. And he was in awe that they looked at him like that. So he wanted to do the best he could for his family. He wanted to make the right decision. But with games, there are certain decisions that you can make that everybody will applaud, that maintains the status quo. And there are other decisions that you make where people be like, no, that's not how we do. And that is what happened to him. Now, his popularity as a gang member spread to other groups, other gangs. Everybody liked this guy. But like always, you're going to have somebody that's in your family that's jealous of him. And Charlie was no exception. There were people in Charlie's uh, life at the time that were gang members, a few of them, they didn't like him. They were jealous of him. Because keep in mind, they were young. They don't understand what's really going on inside of them. None of us really understand what's going on inside of us when we're in those young, young formative years, and then we get up into our teens, and then we get into our 20s. We don't really understand what's going on. But we respond in that way. See, society doesn't give you space to make decisions and make mistakes without punishing you in most cases. You feel me? Because you're going to make decisions, especially if your environment is, is, is geared a certain way and people in your environment that didn't have the benefit of being taught 
and transform from being that way, especially if you got those type of people in your environment and they pass it on to you and they pass it on to the next generation. You don't get that opportunity to try this, see if this works. And then if it doesn't work, you learn from it and you move on and you become a better person. No, a lot of the things that are people coming out of, especially the inner cities, inner, inner cities, those things, that lifestyle, those decisions that you make, they're criminalized and you find yourself in bad situations. And that's what the guy that, that, that was jealous of Charlie was experiencing. His experiences taught him that somebody like Charlie coming in, moving up fast like that, and then all of a sudden, everybody's liking him. Out. His experiences taught him that I don't like this guy. Why do they like him and not me? Why did he move up and not me? So he set out to bring Charlie down. And when I say he set out to bring Charlie down, he did everything he could to undermine it. When Charlie would make decisions about certain things, he would get those brothers that maybe didn't agree with Charlie, but they didn't necessarily disagree either. They were just, okay, cool, let's move on. He would whisper in their ears and tell them now. This ain't how we do. This makes us look weak. This makes us look like we don't want to stand on what it is. We don't compromise with other groups. We don't, Even though it was in the best interest of the organization, he was able to convince a few people that this was the wrong decision. And over time, he built a following within the organization that opposed almost everything that Charlie brought down privately. Publicly, they didn't oppose him yet. They didn't do that yet because they wanted to, this dude wanted to strike at the right time. He knew that he didn't have the numbers, so it wasn't to his advantage to push. It wasn't to his advantage to push. Keep in mind, I'm going to tell you something. When you're dealing with these organizations and the individuals in it, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. They might be ignorant, but they're not stupid. They calculate. They read these books for their laws of power and they get all of these lessons out of them. And then they use them in the wrong way. The art of war, they use it in the wrong way. They use it in a way to, to tear their own people down. They have been convinced that this is how you prosper and you move forward and you become successful in this country. And the whole world practices the same thing. So it's not exclusive to the United States. But again, I'm not going to get political with you right now anyway. So when the time was right, they did. This guy did what people do. He pushed on Charlie. Now, keep in mind, Charlie gets moved from that institution to another. So he really didn't get to feel what was going on behind the scenes when it was brought to light, the way that would cause him harm. But he started to realize that everybody don't agree with me. Everybody don't like me. So he started to develop a bitter taste in his mouth towards this lifestyle because now he's experiencing the fullness of it. And don't get me wrong, he's still in touch with his family. He understands what family's about. His mom and dad and his brother and sister, they come to visit him on a regular basis. He talks to them about the things that he enjoys about them coming to visit. He he talks about the things that he misses, the things that he wish he would have done, all of the things that we talk about when we go see our families and visit and talk on the phone with them. But this other part of his life he left private. He left private. And now his family, they don't have a lot of money. They don't have a lot of means. They don't have a lot. But they make it work. And they're one unit. Families struggle together and prosper together. Remember that. Remember that. Real families struggle and prosper together. But the problem with that is like in gangs, in some families too, you're not taught how to struggle together. You're not taught how to prosper together. Struggling together is having each other's back. Even when the person is wrong, you chastise them in private. But in the meantime, in between time, you stand with them. You let them know this is not how we do, but you don't let no harm come to them. Now, you prosper together by sharing and caring and helping each other. That's what you do. But see, that has to be taught when you're coming up. You can't wait till somebody gets 16, 17 years old and say, do A, do B, do C. No, you got to start out young. You got to start out young. And see, this is what didn't happen with Charlie and Randy. 
Now, Charlie is transferred to the prison that Randy's in. Now, Randy, he sees how Charlie has become this big guy in this gang that he's a part of. How people look up to him and respect him, and, and uh, everywhere he goes, he's got an entourage. He's doing what they do in the penitentiary. He's doing what they do in gang life. He's living the fullness of that life. But he's emotionally immature like most people that are in gangs. He doesn't fully understand the responsibility of being a leader. There's no way he can. He hasn't been taught to understand that. His life growing up didn't teach him to really understand it. His pops was there, but his pops was a victim of society just as much as he was. He didn't understand either. He only passed on to his son what he knew to pass on. Be good in basketball, get your scholarship, and you're going to be just fine. Keep your grades up. See, those are the surface issues that we talk about. We don't get beneath the surface and talk about the qualities that you have to have to be a decent human being. We think that those things on the surface are going to automatically make those things appear. That's not what's going on, y'all. That doesn't happen like that. To be a humble person, to be a caring person, to be a sharing person. Those are the things you teach a child as they are coming up. You don't get 16. You don't wait till they get 16. And when you see your child don't want to uh, share and don't want to do things with other the other, his other, his or her other siblings, you don't say, no, nah, that ain't how you do. You don't do that then. It's too late at that point. Well, it's never too late, but the point I'm making is you should have been laying the foundation when they were younger, when they played together when they was younger so that they would learn to look out for each other. It's not an automatic thing. Not to say that Charlie wasn't nice or, or kind or caring towards his uh, siblings. No, that's not what I'm talking about. He was. But you got to understand that it takes a lot more than a few gestures when you're growing up to become a person that really fully understands what it means to be a leader. He didn't understand that, nor did Randy. But at the end of the day, the, mo the majority of people in prison don't get that either. Now, here we go. Now, Charlie and Randy are back at the same place. And Randy is doing everything he can to get Charlie to walk away from that lifestyle. But Charlie is locked in. He, he, he likes that lifestyle to the point to where he feels like, you know, without this, he would not be the person that he is. He feels that this was destined for him to lead these guys. He feels that he knows best for them. He feels that he believes he can keep some and maintain some order within this chaos. He has drank the Kool-Aid like most people that join games. He thinks he can do the right thing with bad cards. See, he's playing uh, spades when the game is poker. You understand what I'm saying? He's playing spades when the game is poker. He don't even understand the game that he's in. But that's most people. That's most people. But he's going to start to make some decisions. And this guy that's at the other institution that's a part of the same game that he's in is going to start to move up now. And a clash is going to happen. Change is coming. Some things are about to happen that he's not going to be able to understand and not going to be able to cope with. But he's going to have to make some decisions. And if you want to hear what those are, and if you want to hear the rest of this, tune in to the next episode, right? Tune in to the next episode because it's going to get better, y'all. I promise you that. It's going to get better. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker, and I say peace, y'all.